Hello, my friends. Welcome to the Life Shift Podcast. I am here with Nina. Hello, Nina. Hello, Matt. Hello, audience. Well, thank you for being here. I tell this to a lot of other people as well. Anytime there's another podcaster on my podcast, I get all like panicky as soon as we start recording. So I don't know if you have the same thing, but I'm like, oh, no. I think I'm feeling panicky right now, but you know, you're good. Your energy is good. And I'm excited. I've heard your episodes and I'm really excited to get into this conversation. I know we have a lot to talk about. We do. And you know what? It's funny because you have a podcast. It's not funny. You have a podcast that's (laughs) called Grief and Light. And when I first started the life shift, it was in like a class and I was, I was trying to figure out like, okay, what am I going to do for this class assignment? And I was like, I really want to talk about grief. And then I was like, well, that's kind of sad if I talk about grief all the time, even though I wanted to. Mm-hmm. And I love that you found a way to talk about grief, but also mm-hmm. bring in how to move through it and how to find the light in, you know, in the process. I don't think there's an end, but in the process. Yeah. So thank you for what you're doing and putting into the world. And I know it's based on the story you're going to tell today, but thank you for what you do. Thank you as well. And thank you for what you do. And I want to congratulate you on the success of your Mm. podcast. We were talking earlier because I know how much effort it takes and how much love we have to pour into each episode and you do it beautifully. Your conversation, the conversations that you're bringing to the world are helping so many. And I'd listened to quite a few of your episodes actually before this conversation. And, and you could just tell that you, it really is you coming through in each conversation, you're healing, the people are healing, the audience is healing, and it's just benefiting people all around. So thank you for what you do. And I know it takes a lot of endurance. So I see you in that regard as well. I appreciate that. And and what you're mentioning, a, a great journalist, Frank, just put out the this Earworthy Independent Podcast Award. And he actually named the Life Shift podcast as the best overall podcast of the year, which is like, as an indie podcaster, that's not what we do these things for. We're like you said, we put these stories out into the world. But at the same time, it's nice to see that like a stranger has heard the show and is seeing what we're trying to do like within the show. So thank you, Frank, if you're listening now, I it's just such an honor to be part of that list of people. And you should check out grief and light. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> and congratulations on that as well. Thank it's you. Very well deserved. Thank you. So let's get into your conversation. Cause I think I have a lot of questions. Well, I know I will have a lot of questions because grief is really something that I spent so much of my life trying to move through after pushing it down for so long. And so before we get into the details of your pivotal moment, maybe you can just kind of tell us who Nina is in 2024. Like what's, what's your vibe? What's going on now? So today it actually is four years, 10 months since my brother passed and everything has shifted in my Mm. life since then. And I can smile now and get excited about all these things that I'm doing now, the work that I get to do these days, but it wasn't like that. And we'll get into that later. But today I am creator and host of the Grief and Light podcast, which has which originally started as, you know, me exploring my own grief. But it has since evolved into a resource for grievers. And I have found a lot of people ask me, like, how can you work in that space? It must be Mm -hmm. so sad and draining. I have found the biggest sources of joy within this space. And Mm -hmm. that's the irony of it, because I feel like grief and joy are, for me at least, inextricably, inextricably linked. And I think it's a beautiful space to be in. So 2024 version of me gets to work with people who are navigating difficult moments in their life, gets to share their stories, gets to help guide them through, and gets to bring awareness about these topics and connect with wonderful people like you and have these conversations that I love to have that are profound and that are meaningful to me and to a lot of people that get to listen as well. So that's what I'm doing now. <laughs> and that's that's beautiful. I mean, I think it's it's... It's rare, I think, because for so long in my, at least in my experience in life so far, so many people are afraid of grief and afraid Mm -hmm. to live in it, move through it, quote unquote, recover from it, you know, like get to another place, another level, another plane, whatever we're talking about here. And I love that you, one, lean into it really hard, but also 
that people need this service and are willing to accept it. Because I think there was for so long, people were just like shying away and hiding in the shadows. Correct. And now people are seeking this out. And then they have the ability to find someone like you. And then on the flip side, you have the ability probably to process your own stuff while you're also helping other people. So it's 100% beautiful. And I've heard you say that in your episodes before where you say, you know, each episode helps me heal them. Mm. There's a selfish element to it in the, in the nice way of selfish and sense of selfish. And it's, I get to heal as well as I, with every conversation, with yeah. every interaction. And as I move forward on my own journey. Well, what I think is nice about that is just, I think you're proving the value of human connection whether it's about grief or anything else, there's something when we can connect on a deeper level with someone else, there is almost always some kind of healing element, whether that's just immense joy that you felt or you're you're feeling the sadness with someone else and there's that connection there. So right. I think at the end of the day, it's really you're you're just connecting with other humans and you're helping them through the journey that they're going on. So there's a paradox to that, right? We're so connected. Ironically, we're so connected. And a lot of people say this, we're more connected than ever. And yet we're more disconnected. And so the more devices that we have, the more accessibility we have to each other, where those boundaries lie, those new boundaries lie, has mm -hmm. been a little bit confusing for a lot of people. And in trying to protect our private time, I feel like we've disconnected and it's no longer appropriate to reach out to certain people I don't know. It's just, it's gotten yeah. very gray. Let's just it's, say that. It's gotten it's very gray. It's weird. I think things are changing mm -hmm. a little bit. I think for the beginning phases of social media and devices and those kind of things, I think there were a lot, a lot more performative than they are now yeah. in a sense of like only the good things are online. Only... Curated content, right? Exactly. Yeah. And I think maybe some it's people, changing. I mean, I do, I just put it all out there because I think it's important for people to see that, that I don't have good days all the time. And mm -hmm. that, you know, when I am sad, it's okay. And mm -hmm. I will get through it. And I know how to process that. And I want to share that with people. And I'm sure you see this too. When you share your story, you mm -hmm. hear people say, thank you for saying that because I felt alone in that. Or Thank you for just acknowledging that. I would never say it out loud, but you made me feel seen. Yes. We're saying you know? the, the quiet parts out loud that deserve to be voiced. So I said. hope I hope we can get rid of the gray and just be just like full <laughs> humans because I think it's it's uh, important for us and what you're doing on your podcast, what I try to do on this podcast. It's all what we're trying to do is just put it out there in the open because there's mm -hmm. a lot more we have in common than we have differences, you know, so and a lot of it is de demystifying the different topics and the hard parts of life that we were often taught to bypass. So yeah. now there's a, a shift, <laughs> pun intended, <laughs> there's been a shift in how we handle these conversations. And these podcasts have helped demystify the the parts that could feel very difficult. And it helps people have the words and relate and open That's up the their hope. own conversations, which I think is beautiful. That's what we're trying. So mm -hmm. when, let's let's connect with your story. So maybe you can paint the picture of what life was like for you leading up to this moment and go back as far as you need to, to kind of paint your picture. Sure. So it was September, summer of 2019. Let's start there. I was full-time in real estate. So I'm a realtor here in Miami. Um, my husband and I were in business together and we were kicking butt, taking names and, you know, growing our business. And I was very much in that, what I call the masculine mi mindset of just hustle and mm -hmm. getting the work done and growing. And this is my plan, my five to 10 year plan. And this is how I have everything figured out, if you will. How and South Florida of you. I'm sorry. How South Florida of you. As right. Well. <laughs> you know, the poster child over here. So we were doing that and. September rolls around September 10th is my brother's birthday. And it was a Wednesday, Tuesday, Wednesday, can't even middle of the week. And, you know, I, we had plans for the weekend. We were going to celebrate and I was getting off of work. I was do, working late. It was like about seven o'clock and he, I call him and I wish him happy birthday. And I feel bad. Something in me feels really bad and just thinks like, gosh, like it's his birthday. I didn't get to see him. He's like, it's like a regular day, like a very uneventful, boring day for him. It feels kind of bad. So I asked my husband, I said, do you mind if we just drive up there for a second and up there for a second is an hour and a half drive. So mm -hmm. it's not that quickly. 
And to my surprise, my husband said, yeah, no problem. Let's go. Let's go say hi. So that would mean we would get there almost a little before nine o'clock, like, what you know, literally just going over there to give him a hug. But for whatever reason, I just felt that urge to mm -hmm. do that. And I didn't question it. Thank goodness. We went over there. I called my mom, called my dad and said, hey, let's just go get together and like cut him a cake and make it really simple because I know he's not doing anything today. So, so we did. And we ended up having a randomly nice birthday with him. I remember that it was the Oktoberfest beers were out, like the mm. theme beers, and he was drinking that. And, you know, we're cheering and we're like celebrating his birthday, like nothing out of the ordinary. The only thing that stood out to me looking back on it is that at the time, my mother started telling the story about his birth. Like that was random because it's not something that we normally talk about. So she's like, oh, and when you were born, this happened and this and that. And we had this, I even filmed it. So I have it on camera. Oh, wow. Right. And, you know, we're just talking about it like normal. Then we say goodbye. I drive an hour and a half back home. And <laughs> that was that. So I felt good about that because I said, well, that was nice. You know, like yeah. nothing special, but it was actually really nice. The next day, ordinary day, once again, he was supposed to go to my grandmother's house to meet my uncle because my uncle was going out of town and my brother was going to take care of the dog for the weekend. The dog is like a 17 year old Dachshund. Like, you know, he was, he needed, he was just like a, need a lot of help. elderly dog and needed a lot of help. And my brother was very good with dogs. So I FaceTimed my brother. This was around six o'clock in the afternoon. I FaceTimed my brother. He was outside walking towards my grandmother's house. And I remember the sunset was, it was like that golden hour glow on his face. And I kid you not, it's things make sense looking back on them, <laughs> back on, on time and what happened yeah. in retrospect. But at the time, I remember thinking he looks so angelic. And that mm. is literally the word that went through my mind because I don't say that word often. That's not a word I use commonly, but his face looks so like bright and angelic. That's the word I could describe. So I said, Hey, you know, just let me know when you get home, make sure, you know, you get the dog. Great. Two hours later, I'm home. I'm with my husband. We're talking about our day. Like, how was your day? How was your day? Kind of thing. And my husband says, there's this guy at work that asks me how I'm, how are you doing today every day? And it's very annoying because I just saw you yesterday. Like, I'm fine, dude. Like, hi. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I said, well, don't be so harsh. Like I guarantee you, if you speak with this person, if you sit down with this person, it sounds like this is the type of person that doesn't take a day for granted because they've probably been through something traumatic mm -hmm. or something life altering where they don't assume tomorrow and today are going to be the same. I kid you not, right as we're having that conversation, my phone rings and my dad, I pick up, my dad says, are you sitting down? And for context, my dad is a bit of an intense person. Hi, dad. Sorry. <laughs> He's a bit of an intense person. And I told him, you know, you really stress me out whenever you call me because it sounds like something's wrong. Like, could mm. you just let's have a code word or a phrase that mm. if something actually is wrong, you're going to say those words. And so we agreed upon, are you sitting down? And so, however, in that moment, because I was wrapped up in the other conversation, when he said that, I was like, no, why? And I didn't, it didn't click. Mm. And then he said what he said. I almost, I still can't say the words because it's just too, too much. But he said the words that obviously changed everything. And that was about two hours after I had spoken with my brother. So I was like, what do you mean? I literally just saw him on the, you know, FaceTime. Yeah. And Everything for context, changed. he said that your brother had passed. Correct. Sorry. Yes. Thank you for saying yeah. it. I can't say it. <laughs> it's, it's hard. And I get that. I, I'm yeah. it's life is so weird. Like in, I don't, I, I think you know what I mean by that. It's like, everything feels like normal. You're going through your normal stuff and like words that you've heard in different order before in your life are put together in this one sentence from a loved one. And every, you look at things change, everything around you feels different. And I can imagine, I mean, is that how you, is, did you, did you understand it or was it like a shock moment for you? I guess is a bigger Extreme question. Extreme shock moment. So thank you for that question. So 
I always say that something in me disconnected in that immediate moment. Mm-hmm. It was like you took a plug out of a wall, like you yanked it out yeah. of a wall. And something in me was just yanked. That's that second that I heard those words. Right. I heard the words. I didn't understand them. Got it. And I told my dad, you know, I even said something rude to him because I was so mad that he would say something like that. And I don't speak to my father normally like that. But in that moment, I did. Yeah. Because I, it was kind of like, how dare you say something so awful? Like, what's wrong with you? And I was yelling at him, like, that's not funny. How dare you? Yeah. And and then he said, no, this happened. Come home. I need your help. Be- my mom and my brother were extremely close. Like, they have a bond. I'm close to my mom, but I would say they were closer. So my first question when I realized that he was not kidding is, where's mom? Mm. where is mom? And he said, she ran out of the house. I need you to get here as soon as possible. Yeah. And then I realized this is real. Like what? (laughs) And everything changed after that. So when you, when you think about that moment and you don't have to answer this, Mm -hmm. do you, is that something that had ever crossed your mind in your journey, in your family's journey? And the reason I ask that is you know, like sometimes people have these, like, I mean, you kind of said these premonitions of like the angelic thing and, but were those ever, were those planted intentionally, do you think? Or was this like, just so out of the blue, you can't imagine. So looking back on it, reflecting on it, I think so. I think they were planted intentionally, but as everything was unfolding, I had no clue. Mm. And for context, my brother struggled with addiction for many years and throughout his life. And what's different and strange about this time, a lot of people ask me like, well, you know, didn't you see it coming? No, (laughs) no. You always think that happens to other people. Like that doesn't happen to us. That happens to other people. And we fought really, really hard. And when I say we, I don't mean like other people don't fight hard. This is just me talking about my personal story. So we fought very, very hard to, you know, help him. And he had many moments of long-term sobriety. And anybody who's familiar with the world that is addiction will understand what I'm saying. It is something so permanent, so long-term and so cyclical. And it's really, and take life every day, every second, you know, like walk one day at a time type of philosophy. So the reason we were even more hopeful is that he was the birthday that we celebrated was his 32nd birthday. Mm -hmm. He he was years sober and healthy and, you know, had even gained some weight back and was planning his future. And so we said, oh my gosh, this is it. Like we're, we're, we've done it. We're on the long-term road to recovery and we're good. I was very hopeful. It's almost like the time that we let our guard down Mm. for, for once. And so when we celebrated his birthday was September 10th, he passed away September 11th. And, you know, that date is a date that everybody (laughs) recognizes, at least here in in America, right? And it has such heaviness to it. So when this all happened, it almost felt like, yeah, this day is really heavy, but not necessarily for the reasons we originally Mm -hmm. thought. Like, there's so much heaviness around this day. But to answer your question, I did not expect it, not once, not ever. I thought we were going, this was going to be a success story, if you will. Yeah, I, I... And I don't mean when I ask that question, I don't mean it in a in a, like a negative way. I think sure. that now, you know, in my own personal experience, losing my mom to a motorcycle accident, now I like think of things differently, like how like I could just like die today in my car, you know, whereas mm-hmm. before that I they're always safe like that. That would never happen. Like, yeah. so it's interesting to me how how people can like, I I mean, you telling your story about how you saw the light on his face and those kind of things. And looking back, you can kind of see those moments. Like Mm -hmm. when my mom was about to go on her trip, this was their second time doing like a motorcycle trip to from Boston to Colorado. And I was eight. So I don't know. She was 32, which is also very interesting. And I begged her not to go. And I didn't know why. But I threw a tantrum. And of course, like, you're not gonna listen to an eight year old when he, he's just throwing a tantrum, right? But there was something in me, I think, where I kind of like thought this could be something. Yeah. 
And so I don't know where that came from and I don't know how it is. And it kind of reminds me of these little, little pings that you had where you drove an hour and a half to go see him on his birthday when that's not really like a traditional thing that you guys always did in the middle of the week, you know, like just at nine o'clock at night, you know, like these little things that were like nudging you in a weird way. I, I can't imagine how thankful you are for those moments. 100%. It's, it's, I'm, it's to the point that now, if I feel an urge to, if somebody pops into my mm. mind, I will call them. If I feel an urge to do something, I will do. I don't question it ever. Yeah. I never or push it off it or push it off. It is sacred to me. It has become something sacred. And to go back to your point about the pings, I didn't necessarily, looking back on it, I see it. Yeah. But the, there were two people who did have stronger pings and that was my mother. Oh, really? Because she was so close? Yes. and But it happened in a dream. She had this dream mm. where, I'll spare the details, but the, the important part is that she's in this house and my grandmother's there and there's a casket in front of them. And she, in her dream, she thinks it's her dad. So my grandmother's husband, right? So she's like, oh, mom, I'm so sorry. And then my grandmother turns to her and says, it's not who you think it is. Hmm. And my mother never made that connection because that was months before my brother passed. But when she looks back on it, she says, oh my gosh, like yeah. that was such a warning for me and I didn't see it. And then the day of, the day of that my brother passed, my grandfather, and I'll get to that later, but I was going to say both of them who, who are still alive, they're still here with us today, which is another thing that has shifted. But anyway, so he called, he was out of town and he called, he says, I'm trying to call your brother. Do you know where he is? And I was like, Oh yeah, just, I just talked to him. He's fine. He's, mm. And then my grandfather said, yeah, but he's not answering. And I said, yeah, but he, you know, he probably has his phone on. So I'm like, not a big deal. I just saw him. He's right. probably with the dog. And my grandfather was just very pushy, like, no, something he, he's not answering. And looking back on it again, I think yeah. something in he, in him was, uneasy human our brains are so interesting and in the, in the things that that they can do and i haven't made sense of any of it really but it is you know it's interesting to look back on and the reflection piece like i mean the the next part of your journey as you as your life completely changes from this moment yeah the the Benefit is not really the greatest word to use, but the benefit of you being able to reflect on these moments and what that must do for your healing journey is probably pretty profound. So yeah. maybe tell us what happened. Like, tell us how your life changed at that, like after that moment. Absolutely. So, you know, I emotionally, mentally disconnected. I've right. heard people refer to that as dissociation at some point. It's when you feel like you're watching your life in a movie over there. Just kind of going through the motions. You're going through the motions. There's the separation between you being you and and everything that's playing out mm -hmm. in your life. So that's how I felt for a long time. It was very much like a fog. Now, I was devastated that the world kept going. I was mm. like, why is the world still spinning? Like mine literally stopped and I'm still expected to show up to work, to take care of this stuff, to yeah. plan a funeral. Like what? He was my only sibling too. So it really disrupted the family structure as any loss does. But in right. this one, it was, it, you know, we're such a small family. It was, I say we were a four legged table. Now we're this wobbly, like three legged table mm. trying to find our way. And how much so, older were you? Three years, okay. yeah, three years older. He was my, my younger brother. So I wanted the world to stop more than anything. I just said, I need to catch my breath. This is too much. And then the pandemic hit a few months later and, and the stopped. world literally stopped. And I said, ooh, talk about <laughs> you know, the power of your thoughts, I guess. Yeah. Not that I want that because I know a lot of people suffered their own losses in that time. So I'm not making any light of that aspect of it. I'm just saying, like, interesting how that timing played out. Yeah. And in that time, I actually welcomed it in the sense that it was the breath that I needed to catch. It was like, right. okay, we can take a moment that's to just scary sit though here. a lot of people don't they like say they want it and then they don't actually want it I'm sure you've talked to people like that but correct I'm yeah. very much an introvert I enjoy my alone time so much and so in that aspect I was very happy yeah but I was terrified because COVID you know people are saying everybody's dying and all these things are happening and it's you know horrible so I said oh no who else is next like who 
who else is in going your family to... and the right. people around you? Yeah. And I was like, I don't think I could do another one of these. Like, this is insane. So, uh, you know, those t- days unfolded. I didn't know if my parents were going to make it, if we were going to make it, if somebody was going to be next. I had more questions than I've ever had in my life. And I was still working in real estate in a very different capacity because it was shifting with the co- you know, with COVID and everything, lockdowns and weird policies that we had going on. So as that was playing out, I grew less and less tolerance of everyday things like, you know, people complaining about colors and wall colors and carpets and doorknobs and all these things that seem so irrelevant and immaterial and just pointless, to be honest, right? I I found it extremely difficult to sustain conversations with people and sort of try to solve what they deemed to be problems. And here I am like barely surviving over here. Right. So I said, I can't do this. You know, like I have to find meaning of some sort. I have to find support. I don't even know who I am right now. I, the version of me who was trying to 10 X her business and had a 10 year plan and do all these you know, numbers, crunching things, <laughs> couldn't care less. She went yeah. away. And, you know, it just, it just didn't make any sense anymore. It shifted and your values of some sort too, right? Like it you shifted just did everything. You yeah. see, you see someone you love so much not be there anymore. And you're like, why am I doing all these things that aren't filling me with joy? I can, right. but how do you even find joy when you're in deep despair and, Yeah. And it wasn't so much about joy. I I didn't even think joy was possible at that point. I just said, I don't want my parents, something to happen to my parents. I can't lose another person. Mm -hmm. And in, you know, feeling all the feelings that come with grief at one point, I felt like something was physically wrong with me. Like one day I was walking in my grandmother's house. And I say that because one, that's where my brother passed away. He passed away Mm -hmm. in my grandmother's house. And it, you know, over the holidays, for example, my, all my family was there And it sounds strange because if you would have asked me prior to this, like, would we have all gathered in that space where he passed? I would have said, absolutely not. And yet here we were, and we didn't want to be anywhere else. It was like, we wanted to be in that space where he last, you know, spent his last moments, I guess. Yeah. So there's a lot of this journey that you would think you would react a certain way. And yet when it actually happens, you react a totally different way. There was a lot of that going on and, and, you know, navigating it forward and your value system changes. I always say that grief burns everything to the ground. It's very sobering. I live in Florida, so it's like a hurricane that destroys everything. You step outside of your house and you say, now what? Like, where do we go from here? And it changes relationships. It changes the people, not with just like loved one, like, uh, married relationships i'm just saying in general like friendships and you see who shows up you see who cares you see how they care and then you kind of redetermine i think to the parallel it's really interesting i've never really talked to someone i think that that lost someone right before the pandemic and then like you were you were really forced to sit with all of that and Mm -hmm. do you look back on that and and be thankful for that that a quiet time, if you yes. will. Yes, very thankful because it shifted the pace. I need I, t- now looking back on it, I feel like grief can be an invitation to slow down. But how do we do that in a world that's requiring us to move faster right. at all times, right? So be more efficient, do it quicker, you know, move faster. So it was a beautiful pause. Um, and I say it through looking back on my experience. I'm not saying COVID was, you know, the pandemic was beautiful. I'm just saying, Understood. Yeah. Uh, right? So for you or personally. Me, Yes. Personally, it was a beautiful experience in that I got to slow down and I got to think about other things that were not work. And I got to think about, you know, how do I support myself? Because it's not that my parents couldn't support me. It's just that they are grieving the loss of their only son. And I'm, you know, I don't want to add anything to that. So I got to looking like, what is grief? Can you die from grief? Because I was walking and I didn't finish the story earlier, oh, yeah. but I was walking in the house and I felt like I was having a heart attack. Hmm. And I kind of panicked. I, I held onto the side of the wall and I realized, you know, it started to calm down. So I was like, okay, I'm okay. But it got me thinking, can you die from grief? Can grief kill you? Is It's really the question that I had. So I started searching and I found Takotsuba cardiomyopathy, which is broken heart syndrome. And I don't know if you've heard of it. I'm sure you have, but I wouldn't be able to say it as, as <laughs> well as you did. <laughs> 
And it's, you know, in essence, a takotsubo, it's a Japanese octopus trap. And it's in this rounded shape with kind of an open valve. And it's the shape that, and side note, I'm not a doctor, so I'm doing my best to describe this in non-medical terms, but your heart essentially in grief can, it's not something that happens to everybody, but in rare and extreme cases, it can kind of reshape itself Mm. and it doesn't function as properly. And so it could cause some harm. I don't know that you can necessarily, you know, it could cause, it's not necessarily lethal or deadly or anything like that, but I know it could cause heart issues for people and health problems. So I said, okay, well, I don't want anything to happen to me. I don't want my parents to go through anything like this again. So then I started finding ways of coping with grief. Like, okay, so what do I do now? What, what exercises can I do? When does this go away? How long does this thing last? What is it? And how do other people deal with it? And that's where my curiosity started. I don't think a lot of people do that. And, and I guess before you go into that, I was wondering, do you think if the pandemic didn't happen, do you think you would have like snapped back and like push the grief aside and just kind of gone head first back into like the the hustle bustle of South Florida or do you think that you would have found your way here knowing you and who you are I think it would have been a little bit of both I think I would have initially went into it which I did I I did go back to work and I started being very snappy with people and I realized Mm. whoa that's not nice like that's not kind you should probably should take a break and a breather So I think it forces you to stop at some point. It forces you to stop some things. I'm not saying you have, you know, not everybody has the ability to literally pause their entire life, but it forces you to, to show up differently. It, it changes how you show up in the world. It rearranges that. Yeah. Was this your first time experiencing death close to you? No, I had an uncle pass away when we were kids unexpectedly as well, but it's different because we just didn't, it's different. Yeah. Do you think it's different because of your age or do you think it's different because of the relationship or both or? Probably both. And the fact that my brother and I were very, very close and shared so much and he was so much of my peace and with him went the library of knowledge Mm. that me and him, him and I shared together. And yeah, all the memories and who I am in relation to him and who the role that I get to be as a sister. So for example, when I went back to work, somebody said, a colleague said, well, now that you're an only child, blah, 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 blah. And it was like in the movies, like when the audio fades (laughs) and everything slows down. And I said, what did you just say? And it's the first time that I thought of myself as anything other than his sister or a sister. I hope you didn't own that. I mean, I think that I didn't, I do not, but in the moment it shook my, the foundation underneath me. And I was like, is, is this what I am now? You know, am I this only child, if you will? And it really, people say that people don't know what to say. I mean, I, if I can give enough grace to some people that haven't experienced grief, it's really hard to, to kind of figure out there really isn't anything you can say, right? right. Besides, let me know if you need anything. I am here. Everything that you're feeling is okay. Feel what you need to feel, go through it how you need to go through it. But I was asking those questions about previous grief, younger version of grief, older version connection, because in my own story, losing my mom, I didn't understand it. Like, I was eight. Like, I, I knew she wasn't coming back, but I didn't understand the weight of it. And so much of the way that I moved through life after that was off the cues of the older people that also didn't know how to deal with grief because it was late 80s, early 90s. And so people weren't really talking about it, like we, like we said earlier. And so as a young kid, I thought I just had to pretend everything was fine and you just kind of move through life. And, and But then when I was in my 30s, my grandmother, who I was very close with, she ended up getting sick and I knew... Like, I felt like I knew how to do it right as an older Mm -hmm. adult. And maybe it was because I failed for so long as a, as a kid to kind of go through that grief. But, you know, I was curious of like, it's interesting to me when I meet people nowadays that are my age that have not experienced deep loss yeah, and to see how they might go through something like that. 
but my my experiences were totally different and i don't know if it's relationship i don't know if it's sudden death versus extended watching someone die i don't know if it was age i don't know what it is but curious to you know that's why i asked that question that's where it came from if anyone's like that was really rude matt no no thank you for that question and it's very valid in the conversations that i've had with people who have lost a very close loved one at an early age because at that from what i understand and from the conversations that i've had so what i'm about to say is not like law across the board (laughs) it's just feedback that i've gotten from a lot of people is in the young first of all you don't have the context or the language and such an early age and even in adults 20 years ago, let's say we still Mm -hmm. didn't have these type of open conversations. So, and you tend to grieve the milestones and, and it shows up differently throughout different points of your life. So that's what I've heard that it just shifts and evolves and you kind of re grieve certain points of your life is what I've heard people say. Now, as far as the loss that we experienced when we were kids was my uncle. And yes, that was very painful. It was sad, but my dad had this beautiful way of framing it. So he took two cups. One was a solid cup and one was a see-through cup. And he took some water and he put the water in the solid cup. And then he says, this is your uncle and the water is his spirit. And then he poured the water into the transparent cup. And Mm. then he says, now you don't see the cup. So you don't see him anymore, but his spirit still lives on. And so that was a very simple and effective way to communicate this concept. And we didn't question it. It was like, well, dad said he lives on. So obviously he's living on somewhere. We just can't see him. Like he said, So it was almost like a beautiful way of phrasing it. And he said it in a way that was not scary or intimidating. Mm -hmm. It was, it was very matter of fact, like, no, this is, this is just what it is now. So I didn't, now that I think about it, I don't think I saw my dad grieve. And, and that's not to say he didn't, because when I revisited that conversation after my brother passed, I said, you know, how long did it take you? He's like about three years. And I said, what? I don't remember that. You know, like, I don't remember that part of our lives. And it's not that it didn't happen. He was probably very private about it. Right. Did you think of that example when your brother died of the cups at all? Did any of that help you or thinking back to that? Yes, but you it's so close that cup or no cup it's just like oh i don't i don't you know it just sucks the whole situation it kind of gives you it gives you like this weird questioning of everything like questioning of faith if you have that it gives you questioning of like well especially if you have that because then you're like well this doesn't make any sense because you know and then you have questioning of like how who am i without Right. Like, does what does my life look like now? I've always pictured it with him through the rest of my life kind of thing. And so, yeah, it makes you really think. And, and I think something like that example that your father gave you as kids would be a lot harder to just accept at face value as an adult, 100%. in my opinion. No, 100%. And it definitely it would be nice to accept, that, yeah. <laughs> but it's a lot harder. It shakes your foundation. And, you know, one point about faith So when we were, my family's mostly Catholic and when we were moving through, they did all the Catholic rituals, which had a beautiful purpose in giving us something to do together. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, the prayer aspect of it was very beautiful and just taking the time to do this together as a family was very beautiful. It didn't give me any answers. If anything, it gave me more questions and grief took me on this journey of, I literally saw you yesterday. Where did you go? your clothes are right next to me. Where did you go? Like, what is mm. happening? Where, you know, it can't just be here today, gone the next second. And I know all the religious explanations and the spiritual explanations, but that didn't suffice. It was, I need clear answers. Right. <laughs> Universe. I need the science order. part right now. I need the science part yesterday, please. Thank you. Yes. So in that journey, I, I searched and, you know, YouTube algorithm does its thing. And I started finding NDEs, near death experiences. And at first, I heard them and I was like, oh my God, these people are insane. Right? Like <laughs> They've lost their mind. But the more I listened, the more I saw commonalities. And I said, what if there's some truth to what they're saying? Just listen, because they have an answer you haven't heard before. So just listen. Yeah. And I started listening and listening and listening. And probably for three years, I just listened to stories. And I was like, I, I don't know if they're real. I don't know if they're telling the truth, but there was something really 
reassuring about what they're saying and I'll hang on to that and I'll, I'll let that soothe my soul. If nothing more, it's story time. You know, like I just sit back and listen to these stories and yet that opened me up to being, being open, you know, being open to other people's beliefs, being open to other people's processing of grief, being open to the possibility of maybe they are telling the truth. Right. And not labeling things and not shooting on myself. Like I shouldn't believe in this or I shouldn't be doing. No, it was just tell me, tell me more. Yeah. Were you always inquisitive in that way and always a researcher and always like yes. looking for more information? Always. Yeah. Because I think that might have helped in your grief journey because I, I venture to say, and maybe you know better because you talk to a lot of people that are going through actively going through the process of grief. I don't know of a lot of people that like sought out how do I grieve and like find ways to do it. And I don't know that there is a way necessarily. We all have to find our own path, but there are some best practices if we want to call them that, you know, that we can move through. But I bet the fact that you were always inquisitive and open to seeing what other people do or have done probably helped you a lot. Do you, do you think it did? 100%. I've, I, to this day, I always say lead with curiosity. So even today I had somebody message me and ask, is it possible to feel joy after loss? That was her question. Mm -hmm. And she says, I am trying and I cannot figure it out. How did you do it? And I said, you know, all the, I'm so sorry, this and that, but in the conversation, it really made me dig deep for an answer. And I said, absolutely. Joy is possible. Joy is defined differently than it is before he died. It has a different undertone. And there's always, for me, there's always an undertone of sadness. Whenever I think of him, I, the, this word came into my mind. It's felicitreza. So in Spanish, felicidad is happiness, joy, and tristeza is sadness. And I said, it's a compound word. It's happy, sad. And I said, that's joy to me now. It's happy, sad, because happy moments trigger tears of longing and sad moments. And then sometimes sad moments trigger laughter And it's now they're just inextricably linked in my reality now. And so I say it looks different. It feels different, but it is 100% possible. Yeah. And you get there, at least I got there through leaning into my curiosity. And so if my heart is asking questions, how do I do it? It's because it's already capable of doing it, number one. Hmm. And it's already trying to figure it out. So you say you put, I put my hand here on my chest and my heart and I say, thank you for trying. We don't need all the answers right now. We can, it, the tiny, the steps forward are so tiny sometimes mm. that we miss them. And so sometimes it's, they're not even forward. Sometimes, sometimes they're, they're sideways. Forward. Sometimes they're, back. <laughs> sometimes it's a dance and you're just twirling in one yeah. space. Like, but there's a recognition. I encourage people to have a recognition of that curiosity that arises of that desire to want to know how, because the answer will come. It's just, sometimes it doesn't look like what you thought it would look like. When in your grief journey, did you start to feel more like a full human again, or like a full heart beating and like living for, you know, like, not feeling like disconnected, dissociated kind of feeling. How long in your journey did that take? About three and a half years. Yeah. So what in, in that, in the interim, what was a, like a regular time period for you? What did that look like? Like, how do you live and exist and move through that grief actively, but not feel like a full person yet? A lot of grace, I think. Okay. And so what does that mean? My A girlfriend of mine, her mother had passed away 10 months prior to when my mm-hmm. brother passed away. And I called her desperately and I said, I can't, how long does this last? Tell me this goes away, please. <laughs> like, what? how did you do it? Right. Going, and she said, oh, honey, you called me. I'm at the grocery store. I'm at the baking aisle and I have a baking sheet in my hand. And I was just done crying because it reminded me of my mom. And now I have kids and grandma will never make them cookies. And, you know, it reminds me that we will never have this mom daughter moment and she will never see this part of my life. And this is grief. And you need to understand that it's going to show up like this over time, but it will change. And so I said, 
you're, you know, I said, thank you so much. I hung up and I was like, you're crazy. I'm not doing 10 months of this. <laughs> you know, like, I love you, but no, we're not doing this. Show me the answer. Show me the answer. That's, thank you for that answer. That's not the one. <laughs> so I, I, I laugh now because I say, wow, I was so naive. You know, it lasted three and a half years. Or were you hopeful? Like in a weird way, you were hopeful that you could get through it quicker because it was so painful. I was, yes, I was, I guess, unrealistically hopeful that I could get through it quicker. Yeah. I will say this, and people will probably laugh at me, but grieving my mom took me 20 plus years, and I didn't really start to grieve her until I gave myself permission to feel mm -hmm. all the things. Yeah and be okay that I was not okay. And then I got through it. Right. It's different because I don't really remember my mom. So it's more like this morning of the, like you described this figment of, or this, the idea, the milestones missed, those kind of things. But when my grandmother died, I felt like I approached it in the best way I could have. If I could give someone a map on how to approach losing someone and then the aftermath I felt like I could I could do it like because it just felt so right I had the final conversation with her I said everything that needed to be said mm. I sat with her for her last 96 hours in the hospice house just doing whatever she she needed of me she wasn't really cognizant of my presence but maybe she was sure. but after she died I was sad I was very sad but I felt like my grief period was like tiny. Mm -hmm. And I think it was because I was able to do all the things that I didn't get to do when my mom died. Yeah. And I honored myself. Mm -hmm. And I think that was so powerful looking back on it. And so I say people might laugh is because like, I really felt like my grief period after my grandmother died was shortened to like months. Whereas the people around me, like my family still will be like, like sad. Yeah. I don't necessarily get sad anymore because I can remember that, that full cup, like your dad's example, you know, like I can remember that full cup and celebrate all those moments. And so, you know, it's, it's, I think it's, it's nice to when you're grieving to have the hope that you can get through and yeah. like, no, I'm going to get through. Yeah. And so I don't know that it's night. I mean, I guess it is naive because you didn't know better, but at the same time, I think there's some hope in thinking you can do it quick. Yes. And, and what a blessing that you had that opportunity. That's, that's wonderful. I'm so thankful. Yes. And, and I agree. I, you know, part of the conversations and the intention with my podcast is that I want to give people hope. My, yeah. that is part of the purpose. And I'm talking, when I speak this way, I was t tuning into the version of me that was going through that years ago, five, almost five years ago. And that version of me had no idea. And she oh, was, yeah. you know, there were so many things she didn't see coming. And if I were to, you know, phrase it differently, like, what would you do? That's a whole different conversation <laughs> with the tools that I have now, right? Yeah. There's still an element, I want to say there is an element of, you know, sudden loss versus expected loss. And for the longest time, I wondered, would it have been better if I had gotten to say goodbye, right? Because that's, you, it's one of those, like the worst goodbye is the one you didn't get to say, right? Yeah. And the answer to that is, it doesn't matter. <laughs> because really doesn't. at the end of the day, the amount of people that actually get that, that beautiful goodbye that you just described is so it's so rare. It's so few. It's yeah. never it's rarely the way we think it's going to go. And when I look back on, you know, the time the, the last year with my brother, there was this memory that I have us listening to music, we were listening to the Cranberries, which, you know, 90s, 90s. <laughs> but we were listening and all of a sudden he's like, oh, you remember this other song and this other song. And I remember I had to go, we, we had to leave. And I told my husband, can you wait like a few more minutes? And he's like, yeah, yeah, take your time. And my brother was just on this roll of like, you remember this song and this song and this song. And we ended up spending four hours talking oh, wow. about songs and each song had a memory tied to it of our lives together. At that time, I was like, oh, that was nice. Looking back on it, that was my goodbye. I just didn't mm. know that at the time. Yeah. But with sudden loss, a lot of times it takes the shock factor extends and prolongs for many people. This is not for everybody. But for many people, it extends and prolongs the grief process and the acceptance process. 
And because of that, there's a little bit of a lag time to get to a place of, whew, I got this, we can move forward in life. Somebody said sudden loss or expected loss, it doesn't matter. They all lead to the same ocean of grief. Mm -hmm. And it's just how you get there. Now, when you have tools, and this is why we work with people and we have these conversations, when you have tools, nothing really prepares you for the moment or the call, but you can be empowered to have some information where you're not just grasping at thin air and you're not feeling that sense of hopelessness and, and feeling so lost. There's some sort of guidance. There's some sort yeah. of path forward. And I think that's where all of these conversations and, and the one-on-one sessions help. Yeah, no, I think, I mean, you're using your journey as a tool belt, I guess, to help other people and kind of help them figure out what their tool belt looks like and which ones they want to bring with them. I think that's, it's admirable. I, I don't know that I could, I mean, like you said, like you started this out, like people ask you like, Oh, that's so heavy. But I, you know, like there's, there's the hope element that comes to it. Like if I can help you find the tools that work for you, there's hope, you know, like you can, you can get through this. And also you know, but, in your own podcast, like, how many, if you think back on all the interviews, how many of them have elements of grief to them, to the oh, pivot? Yeah. Yeah. If most, we, I mean, those are the ones I connect with the most. So those are the ones I remember the most, but you know, some people have some really light inside moments, which is beautiful too. I know. I don't understand. It. <laughs> no, it's, it's good for them. We're all on our own journeys yeah. and we're all in our own life path and everything, yeah. but it was at the three and a half year mark where I started to pivot. So the big life pivot, the big shock was when my brother passed. But at the three and a half year mark was when I intentionally said, okay, like I want to shed what no longer serves me. And yeah. I want to walk in an aligned path. And that's when the podcast what triggered that. I'm sorry. What, what triggered that? Was it just the idea of the podcast or? No. So it, you know, for siblings, especially adult siblings, there's very little support. There's very little information available. Somebody said to me, a guest said to me, there's less literature on sibling loss than there is on pet loss. Mm. And so there's a, a, a lack of information and resources, particularly for adult siblings and younger siblings. I don't want to, you know, the kids are, right. are very important, but usually like the emphasis tends to be on loss for younger kids. So when I was looking for information, it was so, I, we did not find any. And I said, how is this not being talked about? This is so important. Siblings are called the forgotten, forgotten mourners because it's always, how's your parents? Nobody mm -hmm. asks. I can count on one hand, and my husband can testify to this. I can count on one hand the amount of people that in five years have asked how I am doing. Mm. It, nobody ever asks, yeah. how are you doing? Well, even you asked how your mom was doing. That was my big concern and my dad mm -hmm. as well. So it, you know, I said, there needs to be room for us at the table here as well. And we need to have these conversations. Yeah. And I felt increasingly disconnected from the real estate world. I was, you know, not, my head was not in there. And I said, I'm no good to them. I'm no good to me. So something's got to give. Yeah. And I started working with a career coach who I thought was going to help me re revamp my resume. And she ended up revamping my life and my soul and my spirit. <laughs> She's wonderful. Got more than you paid for. Way more than all my money's <laughs> worth and then some. And she helped me align with the work of grief. I didn't even know this was a thing. I didn't know I could be in this space. I didn't even know. I didn't know it this wasn't was a thing, thing for a it's, long time. I don't even think it is the thing still. It's like <laughs> it becoming a thing. a thing. And I met this beautiful network of people in the grief space, doing similar work, creating spaces for conversations, demystifying the whole spectrum of what is grief and how do we move through it and giving people the tools and words and spaces yeah. to exist. And that's why I say now it's such a beautiful, hopeful and, and, and energizing space to be in, despite the fact that there's so much pain because grief wants to be witnessed. It wants to be expressed. It is something that evolves as we evolve. And in that, it could be such an alchemizing process if you allow it to be. Now, the caveat, because it's such a nuanced thing, you don't have to make meaning if you don't want to. You don't have mm -hmm. to have this grandiose outcome if you don't want to. The example I use is my mother. I have invited her to the podcast a bunch of times, and she says, I don't want to talk about it publicly. Yeah. I don't want to make meaning out of my son's death. And I don't feel like starting a foundation and creating all this stuff, at least not today. And yeah. I say, and that's perfectly okay. 
that is so valid too. So there's this, a lot of people impose on her, like, you should do this and you should do that. And you should start a scholarship. And she says, I don't want to, I just want to grieve my son. Yeah. And so it's entirely personal, but if you do want to go in that direction, there is a space in a community ready to talk about it and be with it. I think that's important for people to have that awareness. I think it's also really powerful that your mom feels strong enough to tell people no. You know, and like, that's just not because I bet the people that are saying that are just uncomfortable and they don't really know what to say. And so they're just like suggesting like whatever they saw on TV or, you know, like whatever they see other people to do or people do. So like good on your mom for just like standing in it and saying, no, I'm good. I'm going to I'm going to do it the way I need to do it. Exactly. Because she does do it. She spends time with him and his memory and she does her craft and that's her time with him. But that's her process. And I wish people would honor everybody's process a little bit more, a lot more. Yeah. Well, I think that you're just opening that door for people to see, because mm-hmm. I think the more it's like any, anything else, we, the more we put it out in the light, people are going to see it. Then they can think about it. Yeah. Then they can explore it. Like you did with the near death experience things you like, maybe that was the first time you had seen it. And then you watched a bunch of videos. And then at first you were like, this is a little wacky, but now right. everyone's saying the same thing, you know? Right. And so the more you got exposure to it, you're like, cool. If that's working for them and that's how they want to express that or think about that experience, who am I, exactly. you know, like I could do it however I want. And I think grief is super important. And I think it's talked about more, but it's not talked about enough. Yeah. And guess what? we're all going to experience it at some point in our lives because we don't all live forever and I don't really want to. It's the one thing we have in common. Yes. It's such a (laughs) universal experience. And that's part of why it puzzled me that it wasn't more talked about. If you were to ask your husband, the difference between five years ago, Nina and you now, (laughs) what would he say? I think there's parts of me he misses, you know, that I was a lot more carefree and I was a lot more, you know, just things didn't feel as heavy. Yeah. There's a heaviness to me now. And I also feel that that's because my brother bought, brought a lot of joy and laughter and lightness to life. And I feel like that also left. But at the same time, he sees me more at peace in a weird way and in my elements and speaking and walking in my truth. And I think he values that as well. So he's been wonderful. I, I know that it could take a toll on couples and marriages and relationships. He's been wonderful throughout this whole experience and learned a lot as well. And, yeah. you know, he now probably have his own podcast about that. 100%. I don't think he will, but he, he now understands why that coworker was asking, how are you doing today? Mm. Yeah, no, I think it, I think that's another element that people should think about of like, maybe they aren't seeking out how to go through grief, but maybe they need to support someone. that is grieving and like listening to stories on your podcast and listening to other people kind of go through it and talk about what they needed at the time is probably really valuable because I think there's a lot more people that are in the support role than the people that are actively grieving, if you will. Definitely. And, and there's, you know, grief, what I call big G grief is related to somebody's passing Mm -hmm. and little G grief, which is, everyday grief. You know, sometimes Mm. we grieve our identity or what could have been or a loss of a relationship or things that are not necessarily a death, a physical death. Um, but we all go through something, you know, if you look deep enough there, it's, there's something there. I don't want to be the person that says like, everybody's grieving, but there's an element of, we are human having a, you know, human experience. And therefore you are going to experience loss, change, difficulties, challenges, and all of that has an element of grief and yeah. understanding how to move through that is, is huge. So it's, it's, it's important. Yeah. If you could go back to the Nina that just hung up the phone after talking to your dad, knowing what you know now, cause it's been a little bit, it hasn't been a long time, but it's been a little bit. Is there anything you would want to say to her that might help her in that moment? You know, I think about that question a lot <laughs> and I think Whatever I would have said, I don't think that version of me would have believed. I would have been there. I would have hugged her and held her and said, maybe nothing, just been with her. They say the best therapist is a four-legged pet, like Mm. cats and dogs. And that's no diss to therapists because you're essential in this work. Um, And I actually learned that from a therapist. But the reason for that is that they are mere presence. Mm. Pets are 
presence full, yeah. fully in the moment. They're not necessarily, to our knowledge, thinking about the past or the present. They are here and they are in tune with our emotions and our beingness. And that is more than anything, oftentimes yeah. what grievers need is just that I'm here sitting in this with you. I'm not trying to fix you. I'm not trying to change the unchangeable, fix the unfixable. I am here with you. And I think ultimately more than saying anything to her, I would have just held her. Well, I will say that a great percentage of the people that I've talked to on this podcast, when I asked that question said, there's nothing I could have said. I would just give them a hug. Yeah. And it's true. I th And we said this earlier, there's really not anything you can say to someone that is in that space at that moment beyond I'm here. Mm -hmm. And that hug is I'm here. We don't have to say anything. We can look at each other. We don't have to look at each other. I'm just here. And I would probably say the same thing to the eight-year-old version of me, you know, that his dad sat him down and told him and he didn't know what to do, but I think a hug would have made him feel safe. And I think that's what we need is just like grounding and safeness. So yeah. I'm sorry that you had to go through this, but what I think is beautiful is that you've taken this horrible experience that you've gone through. You've gone on your journey, you've found this new version of yourself, and now you're helping other people because of it. Yeah. And so I think your brother would probably be pretty proud of that. Thank you so much. Yeah. And I say grief is, it taught me that it's not this or that, it's this and that. It throws mm -hmm. you in the world of living in the and. And this is how I get to be his sister. This yeah. is how I get to live authentically in my truth. And this is how I get to make a difference. So it's an honor to be in this space. It's an honor to work with people. It's an honor to share yeah. these stories and to meet with people like you and have these beautiful conversations. Well, speaking of that, to meet more people, is there like, if anyone's listening and wants to connect with you, like what's the best way we'll give them the link to your podcast and stuff, but tell us like the best way to get in your orbit. Definitely Instagram is where I'm most active at grief and light. All my social media handles, YouTube, the channel website, everything is grief and light. So at grief and light, grief and light .com. I usually respond rather quickly, as quickly as I possibly can without getting overwhelmed. So that's the best way to reach me. And the awesome. podcast is available on all platforms, including YouTube now, which is something I started recently. Yeah, that's a whole other journey. A but whole other <laughs> good luck with that. <laughs> yeah. I will. Yeah. <laughs> I will put all the, the links in the show notes. So if anyone listening now, you want to connect easily, just go to the show notes, click it, click it. You can go wherever you need to go. If, if for some reason you want to reach out to Nina and tell her a little bit of your story, or you resonated with a part of her story, I'm sure she'd be happy to hear from you. Yeah. And maybe, you know, someone in your life that's kind of going through it. And maybe something that we talked about in this conversation, you think they might want to hear. We'd love it if you share this episode with them and and maybe just by hearing it, they'll feel less alone or they'll feel inspired to look at something or reach out to one of us. We'd love to, to talk to others about this. So thank you for telling your story in this way. I know we went in corners that maybe we don't usually go in. So thank you for allowing me to ask the questions that I have. Thank you for providing the space for your questions and for the beautiful, beautiful work you do. Thank you, Matt. Well, I appreciate you. Everyone listening, I appreciate you as well. If you have a moment, maybe a little rating and review on Apple Podcasts would be great for both of our podcasts. And with that, I'm going to say goodbye and I'll be back next week with a brand new episode of the Life Shift Podcast. Thanks again, Nina. Thank you, Matt.